Now, a very special tribute for Secretary George Shultz. There are several written tributes to the secretary in the program that you have, and it's in the link is in the chat box, sharing all of his contributions over 100 years. We now have two videos for you. One is a tribute to the secretary, and the other is a joint interview with Secretary Schultz and Dr. Henry Kissinger, moderated by our Asia Society Policy Institute VP, Danny Russell. We believe the secretary is in the audience watching with us live. And now to introduce this tribute is our honorary chair, Jack Wadsworth. Jack. Margaret, thank you so much. And uh, congratulations on uh, an absolutely amazing uh, program. Uh, Secretary Schultz, Secretary Kissinger, President Rudd, I'm happy to say, fellow directors of the Asia Society Northern California and around the world and friends from around the world. It is truly a privilege to gather today to honor our Asia Society Northern California Honorary Chairman George Pratt Schultz on the occasion of his 100th birthday and his retirement from our board. In addition, today's gathering will combine this celebration with a conversation about the future of the US-China relationship, as well as a conversation between George and Henry, moderated by Danny Russell, as Margaret just said, on the subject of diplomacy, past, present, and future. This conversation will also examine the outlook for the US-China relationship, so it is appropriate to combine this subject with diplomacy. Um, Sorry, um, the answer must be found in a combination of a diplomatic process as well as a clear agreement on the issues. We hope the answer will be diplomacy based on engagement, respect and trust, not confrontation and conflict. George reminds us often that trust is the coin of the realm when there is trust in the room, he says, good things happen. When trust is not in the room, good things do not happen. Everything else is details. George and Henry have been mentors and influencers for the better part of a century. Together overlapping two centuries, they have played central roles in many administrations and between the two have held six cabinet positions. They have been mentors to many diplomats and we at the Asia Society have been the beneficiaries of at least two of these giants, namely Nick Platt, who was our president for many years and Richard Holbrook, who was our chairman. George and I share a common devotion to the Booth School of Business at Chicago. He was the Dean when I was a student. Booth academic thought leaders motivated by George during his years as Dean were doing the research and created our modern capital markets and many Nobel laureates. We both share an admiration for Chicago tradition of research and inquiry and data. As honorary chairman of the Asia Society Northern California, George gave us the wise counsel and produced the courage to engage in programs, initiatives and leadership in our community that has enabled us to punch way above our weight and to attract the very best team, both staff and board members to lead our center here in San Francisco. In this vein, the last 12 months have featured a stream of programs focused on China. There have been 33 programs focusing on specific issues related to China and its relationship with the US. Today's conference is the capstone of this series. The US and China are destined to be competitors in my view, but let's hope it comes with engagement and trust, not confrontation. I am hopeful that having learned from Henry and George that relationship building and frequent interaction where each side puts all the issues on the table is the only way to foster trust and solve problems. Trust, as George says, is the coin of the realm. Margaret, run the video. On behalf of the American people, 
I want to compliment the Senate for its wisdom in approving so rapidly and decisively the nomination of George Schultz as our next Secretary of State. George, welcome to the team. I think George Schultz was one of the most outstanding Secretaries of State since World War II. Well, George Schultz was as fine a model of public service uh, as I ever saw over the course of my career in government. I will take these words of yours as my touchstone and foundation as I approach the conduct of this great office. He combined character and integrity um, with professional skill and intellect and patriotism in a way that created a wonderful role model for my generation of career diplomats. In case anyone hasn't noticed, there's a new face at the table. <laughs> when George Schultz became Secretary of State in the middle of 1982, the world was blowing up. We had all kinds of regional issues and a lot of confusion um, in the White House and the State Department about the purpose and direction of U.S. foreign policy. You had tensions with China over Taiwan to a certain extent. Uh, you had the ongoing Cold War uh, with the Soviet Union. Just finished a set of meetings and marked by a general desire for a continued positive development in relationship between the United States and the Soviet Union. He'd held three other cabinet positions. He'd been a labor negotiator. He'd been an academic at MIT. He brought to bear all of that experience on to the world stage to address the most significant issues of war and peace at the time. He understood equally that diplomacy was, as he used to put it, kind of like gardening in the sense of the unremarkable, not always visible, day in, day out work of building alliances, of building personal relationships, of mobilizing coalitions of countries, of establishing trust, um, both with your allies and partners, and a certain degree of trust, even with your adversaries and rivals, so that when the moment came, either the moment of crisis, when you had to call on people, allies to work with you, or um, try to manage um, crisis situations with um, adversaries and rivals, that you had already built up some capital through that careful effort at gardening on which you could draw. You know, it's easy in hindsight to think that the kind of peaceful end of the Cold War and the ultimate collapse of the Soviet Union was foreordained. This agreement complements our ongoing and promising efforts in Geneva to achieve for the first time deep, equitable, and effectively verifiable reductions in Soviet and American nuclear arsenals. His core achievement of expanding the relationship with China beyond just resistance to the Soviet Union and stabilizing relations with Moscow at the same time uh, put us on a course with both those communist giants that still has relevance today. You know, one of his biggest contributions, I think, to American diplomacy was to have established uh, the Foreign Service Institute, the National Foreign Affairs uh, Training Center, on which um, the State Department could focus on the importance of education and training. And you know, that was a reflection, I think, of his commitment to the institution which has left a mark, um, certainly on my generation of American diplomats, but on several generations to come. Also, he is someone who was an early champion of race equality in the United States. And he doesn't get much credit for the work that he did in the 1970s to integrate public institutions, um, to use um, public resources, um, to expand opportunities, for African Americans and people of color. And I've always been struck in the years since Secretary Schultz's government service by his continuing curiosity about the way in which the world is changing, by his commitment to diplomacy, by his genuine commitment to advancing the interests and the values of the United States. He began again to uh, work on energy issues, to work on 
technology and policy issues to continue to think about diplomacy, a deep commitment to a bipartisan foreign policy, to nuclear um, nonproliferation. He has also, of course, been leading and teaching at Hoover and Stanford uh, and has written uh, extensively in, in newspaper articles. So this person has contributed greatly in his post-government years. When I had a decision to make, George was the first or one of the first people whose advice I've sought. He studied each subject with enormous dedication. And in the process, I learned from him about subjects I had not addressed before. At age 100, uh, you know, Secretary Schultz, I think, is as vibrant and curious as I ever saw him many, many years ago as a young Foreign Service officer. But in the years since then, he's been a powerful voice um, in, in trying to call attention to the significance of those issues, to the importance of diplomacy in addressing them. I think George Schultz will have a lasting legacy, but as a public servant, generally, I think he has few peers. Now, 150 years ago, Alexis de Tocqueville detected that spirit when he described Americans as eager for change and self-confident in their ability to master the future. That spirit of adventure, not only our material resources, has brought us into the front rank of nations. The common thread tying together these achievements is a sense of adventure, of experiment, of anticipation of the future. And that's my message. Let's embrace that future with a zest that makes us great. Let's play the winning hand that we hold. Thank you. Secretary Schultz, Secretary Kissinger, thank you both so much for joining us today. Uh, as a veteran of the Foreign Service, I can't tell you what an honor and a pleasure it is to speak with you both. But first and foremost, Secretary Schultz, happy 100th birthday. Uh, as a tribute to you and as part of the future of U.S.-China conference, uh, the Asia Society is honoring you for your lifelong contributions to U.S. foreign policy, your longtime service as the honorary chair of our Northern California Center, and in celebration of your of your great centennial birthday. So on behalf of the Asia Society and all my colleagues, Secretary Schultz, congratulations. Thank you. Sometimes people ask how it feels to be 100. I said it feels just like it felt being 99. No difference. <laughs> well, um, Mike Mansfield was in his mid-80s uh, when he served as ambassador, and I think... Uh, he got tired of people remarking on his age. So he used to say, well, the first 80 years are the hardest. Dr. Kissinger, I heard you say that uh, George Schultz had a tremendous influence on your life. He, he had a six year head start on you, but um, what was it that uh, made such an impression on, on you? What is it that you were referring to about Secretary Schultz? About 25 years ago, I wrote an essay about leadership. And I said, if I could appoint a president of the United States, I'd appoint George Schultz. Because I had seen him in a number of major positions. <clears throat> and I had learned that he studied each subject with enormous dedication. And in the process, I learned from him about subjects I had not addressed before. There was one moment in our country during the Watergate crisis when it seemed very important to get a core group of people who could make sure that for a critical period, 
policy would be conducted in a careful and systematic way and to assist the president in a manner that uh, would hold things together. And the person that first came to my mind to deal with it was George Schultz. And uh, it wasn't an assignment that was official, but we the judgment was needed on a daily basis when there were many influences until a new chief of staff had been appointed. So that was symbolic, but in my private life, when I had a decision to make, George was the first or one of the first people whose advice I've sought. And he's made life joyful and useful. And every year he gave a party for me when I came to the West Coast to go to the Bohemian Grove and speak at the Hoover Institute. And it all, every party had the theme of a different region of the world, which showed what George has meant to our country and to me. I could fill this whole half, half hour we have talking about George Rhodes. Uh, He's been a friend and an inspiration. And I'm honored to be here. So I'm happy, George. Well, thank you, Henry. I appreciate your praise, but I have one correction to make. Those parties that are such good fun are all due to a woman named Charlotte. She's the one who puts them on. And man, if you ever get invited to a party given by Charlotte, you go because it's going to be a blast. I think that is right. Well, that's a wonderful and a joyful testimonial, Dr. Kissinger. Thanks. And you you pointed out the uh, the tremendous uh, and extensive experience of Secretary Schultz as Secretary of Labor, Secretary of the Treasury, Director of OMB, President of a major U.S. company. Uh, and that's one of the many, many things, Secretary Schultz, that I think you had in common with Mike Mansfield, uh, which is a tremendous amount. You, you brought a tremendous amount of, of experience in domestic affairs to the task of diplomacy and your story Mike, of... Mike was a majority leader in the Senate when I was um, Secretary of Labor and we became friends. And I can't say anybody that I admire except Henry than Mike Mansfield. Well, I'm, I share that uh, view. I worked closely with Ambassador Mansfield and stayed very close to him and to Maureen for the rest of their lives. Uh, and I found him uh, always very attentive, uh, not only to domestic affairs and politics, but to personal affairs. He really listened and cared about everyone that he, he met. And it seems to me, Secretary Schultz, that um, that approach, your approach, is very relevant today in light of President-elect Biden's pledge to conduct a foreign policy for the middle class. In other words, he's saying that he will try to ground his foreign policy in the agenda for domestic renewal here at home. And I'd love to ask your view on making foreign policy support uh, the domestic agenda. How, how doable is that? And, and in this day and age, uh, what could that look like? Well, I think the people at the end of World War II, Truman, Acheson, and so on, Marshall, they must have looked back, and what did they see? They saw two world wars. The first settled in rather vindictive terms that helped lead to the second. 
they saw 52 million people were killed in the Second World War. They saw the Holocaust. They saw the Great Depression and the protectionism and currency manipulation that aggravated it. And they must have said to themselves, what a crummy world. And then they saw something the opposite after World War I. You remember, we walked away. They said, we're part of it, whether we like it or not. And they started to remake it. Remember, at Bretton Woods, there were some 40 countries. So we weren't alone. We, but out of Bretton Woods came the IMF to work on currencies, came the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development, now the World Bank, and the um, General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade that became the World Trade Organization and stood for open trade. So this was laying the groundwork for a revolution that happened. So these people were changers and they did NATO and they did a lot of things. We need something like that now because we have to realize whatever state the world is in, we're part of it, whether we like it or not. So the better it is, the better off we are. Well, that of course makes great sense. And uh, whether we like it or not, uh, we're uh, part of a world uh, that also includes China uh, in a very substantial way. And so I'd like to pick up on uh, the issue that's really at the heart of the conference and at the center of nearly every conversation about foreign policy, the future of US-China relations. Um, and Secretary Schultz, in your case, I recall you took over as Secretary of State in 1982, a time of uh, tremendous friction with Beijing over Taiwan. And you left office in 89, uh, well before the Tiananmen uh, Square massacre. But during your tenure, uh, US-China relations flourished. Uh, whereas today, uh, we may be at a turning point along the lines that you just mentioned in history. Uh, Dr. Kissinger warned we may be in the, in the foothills of a cold war, if not a little bit further up in the mountain. So my question, Secretary Schultz, is was there anything in your experience dealing with China in the 1980s that you think is relevant or applicable to today's situation? Or are there any clues uh, from that experience about what could be done uh, going forward today uh, to put the US-China relationship on a healthier track? I think so. With the president's approval, I went to Beijing. I saw all these problems. And I said to uh, the leading powers there, you put on the table everything you want to talk about. I'll put on the table everything I want to talk about. Let's construct an agenda out of that and then work our way through the agenda. And I'll agree to come here at least once a year. You, my counterpart, come to the US once a year. And we meet in about three international meetings each year. Let's drive out about four hours just for us and our interpreter, work our way through the agenda. and that, works well. We confronted problems. We became friends, trusted each other. One time I was in Beijing and I said to uh, the powers that be, every time I come here, you put me up in the state guest house. We have meetings in the Great Hall. I read that China's a great country. As far as I'm concerned, there's two buildings in the road. <laughs> so my counterpart took my wife and I and his wife on almost a one week tour of China. And we had fun, we became friends, we trusted each other, and we were able to work together. And that's, you have to work at these things on a personal basis. And you have to realize some brute facts, like if a country consumes more than it produces, it will import more than it exports. That's not economics, that's arithmetic. And we do it regularly by our explosive federal deficit. So it's no wonder that we have a trade deficit and trade it's us. So let's get it straight. 
Well, I know Secretary Schultz that um, you've talked about the importance of trust in a relationship, trust in diplomacy, and that trust is something that has to be earned, uh, that it has to be based on undertakings that can be seen to be carried out. So I, it uh, strikes me that part of your message is that trust building is, is a practical project. It's, it's not a romantic ideal, but we're in a, an environment where there's a dramatic deficit of uh, trust and there are pretty profound uh, prejudices and political headwinds to an effort to engage in a kind of uh, dialogue that uh, you were able to engineer with your counterparts in Beijing in the uh, 1980s. I wonder, Dr. Kissinger, if you have thoughts about a formula for uh, engineering a U.S.-China relationship that serves the best interests of the United States, given where things stand today. I encountered China when uh, Mao was the leader and the United States had had no dialogue with China for 25 years. There had been no diplomatic dialogue with China. They were meeting, there was a place for meetings in Warsaw of the two ambassadors. And they had 162 meetings and they all followed the same formula that the uh, Chinese would say, we had to begin by recognizing Taiwan as part of China. And we said they had to begin by renouncing the use of force and that was the end of the meeting. So when we opened relations with China, it reopened relations with China in 1971, we decided that we would do what George has described, namely discuss the issues that existed around the world. And the then Chinese Premier Zhou Enlai and I would spend long hours talking almost like college professors on the theory that when practical problems arose, we should understand the basic thinking of the other side. At that time, China was a developing country. And it has really gone through three phases, at least, in my observation of it. The first was when both China and we were concerned with the impact of the Soviet Union on international stability. And they, China and we, had parallel interests. Then there was an intermediate period in which China began to develop its economy. And the early pattern of our relationship still was maintained. Then there came the fairly recent period where the evolution of technology has been so explosive that both China and we find ourselves in a unique position for each country, which is we are both devoted to a view that each country has exceptional qualities. It's been for both of us, our history. Our notion of exceptionalism is human liberty exemplified by America. Their notion of, exemplary, of exceptionalism is a performance of a magnitude that other countries are respected or sometimes even in awe of it. 
So how to reconcile this new period in which conflict between the two of us will tear the world apart and cooperation requires both of us to learn a new approach to the idea of global influence. Uh, that's a big challenge today. And that's a big opportunity for the new administration. Wow. Well, um, let me pick up on some of those uh, points, particularly uh, Dr. Kissinger alluded to American exceptionalism. And uh, I'd like to ask you, Secretary Schultz, you, you in your tenure built a really impressive record of democracy promotion around the world, not only in engineering a peaceful resolution of the Cold War, but uh, also democratic progress in Latin America, and, and most notably, I think, in, in Asia, the shift from dictatorships to democracy in the Philippines, in South Korea, and in, in Taiwan. Um, so is there a way in our relationship with China to integrate our values, uh, our support for human rights? Uh, can this be part of our policy towards China, but uh, still allow us to actually get things done and, and to make progress? Well, we want to be sure that when we travel, our values travel with us. So we're not afraid to say what we're for and how we think a society should be organized. But they have their way of organizing their society, and we shouldn't think that we're going to tell them how to do it. Uh, if they adjust, OK. But we can talk to them sensibly on the basis of two different systems. There's no reason why that can't be done. All we have to do is get people like Dr. Kissinger to give us the background thoughts on how to do it, and you can do it. Well, doing it is, of course, um, what we call diplomacy, and, and you two are uh, two of the absolute greatest practitioners of that art. And Secretary Schultz, you're, among other things, famous for creating the Foreign Affairs Training Center uh, in Washington, which has been named after you. Uh, it's trained so many of my colleagues. Uh, you're also famous for your analogy of diplomacy and intending the garden. But you know, even gardening has been transformed by technology today. Uh, and diplomacy, of course, is increasingly conducted on Zoom and on Twitter. I wonder, uh, Secretary Schultz, what your thoughts are on what is or isn't different uh, in terms of practicing diplomacy in, in today's environment. I still think the image of gardening is a good one. If you plant a garden and you go away for eight months and you come back, it's full of weeds. If you tend that garden regularly, you get no weeds. So you have to tend any relationship regularly and garden it. The same is true with China. You have to be there with significant people and tend the garden. Then I think on a personal level, you need to build trust. Trust is the coin of the realm. And there's no reason why you can't build it with people who are your adversaries. It's a personal thing. They trust you. I'll give an example. There was a man named Edward Shevardnadze. He was the foreign minister of the Soviet Union, our deadly ally during the Cold War. And he came to me once and he said, we have decided to leave Afghanistan. We haven't decided when, we haven't decided when to announce it, but we're gonna leave. So I'm telling you this so you and I maybe can talk a little bit about how to have this come about in a way that minimizes the loss of human life as it proceeds. Well, the only person I told was Ronald Reagan. He knew, he trusted me. He knew I wouldn't go blaring it. It was a huge piece of news, but I wasn't gonna go blaring it out because he trusted me to know better. 
And the say you can build trust with people, even though they're your adversaries, by the way you behave. And I think that's we need to have people in Beijing who build that kind of trust and confidence so they can have frank discussions with other people. It's a personal thing. Well, um, clearly building trust is one of the enduring uh, aspects of uh, good and effective diplomacy that has uh, that endures beyond this technological revolution that we're experiencing because people but, are people. It's non-existent right now. Nobody seems to trust anybody. No, uh, we're dealing with a, a absolute maelstrom of, of mistrust, both uh, domestically, unfortunately, as well as uh, in the US-China relationship. And President-elect Biden has made very clear uh, the priority he places in the first instance on, on building uh, a domestic consensus, but also on reestablishing close closer ties and more trust uh, between the US and our allies and, and particularly our democratic uh, and free market partners. But Dr. Kissinger, you, you literally wrote the book on diplomacy. <laughs> and I remember you once it's said- books about it. <laughs> Dr. Kissinger, I remember you used to say, the Pentagon is organized to make decisions uh, the State Department is organized to have conversations. <laughs> I think uh, in diplomacy, we're going to need more uh, of an action orientation. Um, but Dr. Kissinger, you and I have also talked about just the pace of technological development and how that complicates the strategic equation. Uh, do, you, do you have some thoughts about what uh, we need to bear in mind in conducting effective diplomacy uh, in today's environment? Well, first, I agree with what Georgia said. And I would simply uh, add to it that uh, that personal trust will develop best if your actions are predictable and if the other side's actions become predictable. So a periodic dialogue uh, between not so much the two leaders, but I, I have suggested in previous periods that each president should appoint somebody in his office with primary responsibility for Chinese relations and the Chinese for American relations. Because we are the two largest economic countries in the world. We cannot help interacting with each other. We are bound to have an impact on each other. Uh, by the very nature of our actions. And we have to be careful in this period that historically, in such situations, conflict was the dominating characteristic. But we have to find a way of dealing with each other based on an element of cooperation together with the recognition by each side of the limits beyond which conflict becomes too likely. And we are in this strange situation now for quite, for almost half a century, that the main weapons of the, of, of the big countries get refined year after year and they've never been used. And they haven't been used for a very good reason, that the consequences of using them would be so appalling and would so destroy humanity. So, so 
it is necessary to do two things, to have an understanding on what can be done together, like say climate change, many uh, practical things, and how we can limit the conflict aspect. Uh, George and I had tracked two discussions on that subject with the Chinese 10 years ago, and it's not been pursued since then, but it needs to be started because uh, it needs to be understood that the technology of our world is so dangerous that it cannot be used in the traditional way. Uh, and that's a very important insight, but very difficult to do uh, given the nature of that technology. Uh, George had did great things in that respect with nuclear weapons in the American relationship with the Soviet Union. Uh, but the technology has gone beyond that. So a new, con a new way of doing it or a, an extension of the way it's been done will have to be built into the relationship at some point. What I'm hearing from both of you, I, which I think is just very uh, profound and wise, is uh, the need to establish uh, a relationship of uh, mutual understanding that uh, builds trust uh, as a foundation for uh, collaboration on areas where our interests overlap, uh, but also uh, as the basis for uh, collaboration on, on risk management and on risk uh, reduction. Uh, that sounds right. like... I think we're looking at our Chinese problems now from the outside in. We're pounding away from the outside to get changes in questions. I think we should be working at it from the inside out, where we have a chance to talk about people and say, here's this problem. Maybe we can resolve it, maybe we can't, but at least let's set the parameters and so on. And you'll get further that way if you can work at it. Right now, we're at loggerheads all the time. Yeah, uh, if only it were, if only it were loggerheads, <laughs> I think uh, we're in, we're facing a tremendous uh, trust deficit in, in both directions that uh, going to require the kind of work uh, and the kind of uh, tending the garden that uh, you've eloquently described. Well, Mr. Secretaries, you've both been very generous with your time and you've shared uh, important insights and given us a great deal to think about. Secretary Schultz, uh, Congratulations again to you both on your centennial milestone and on this special tribute by the Asia Society's Northern California Center. I think Asia is an area of immense importance to us. So Asia Society helps us understand it better and figure out how to work with it better and as a positive and a constructive contributor to the U.S. policy as a result. And on a personal note, I have to tell you that really from the time that I joined the State Department, I have admired your decency, your personal integrity, uh, your character, as well as, of course, your intellect, your accomplishments, and your diplomatic skill. So you have my deep respect. Secretary Kissinger, you know how I feel about you, but I'm going to save my accolades to you until 
your centennial, which is still a few years out. Um, but I will point out that he's a promising young man from my standpoint. <laughs> and George should be the major speaker at my centennial. All right, I'll do it. We'll we'll ask Margaret to set that up. Um, I will end just by pointing out uh, that a very wise man uh, who happens to be on the screen once said, it's not often that nations learn from the past and it's even rare that they draw the correct conclusions uh, from the past. But I wanna thank both of you for helping us to not only learn from the past, but to think wisely uh, about the future and particularly uh, about the future of US-China relations. Thank you, very important topic. Thank you for the way that you conducted this as you have everything that I've experienced in my relations with you. So all the best to you. Our thanks to Danny, Dr. Kissinger, and to Secretary Schultz. Happy 100th birthday. We see you here live in the audience with us now. It has been an honor to have you as our honorary chair.